Breakfast with Pablo. Now, you may have heard Peter Fitzsimmons has lost some weight, and not just a little bit of weight, a massive 45 kgs and counting. The former rugby player joins us on the phone today. Peter, good morning. Good morning to you. How are you? Very good. Now, almost one third of your body weight. Uh, first up, yep. well done. Thank you. A lot of people look at me and say, somebody that loses that much weight that quickly is either very, very well or very, very crook. And as it is, I'm jumping out of my skin. <laughs> I feel very, very well. And look, the essence of it is, I lost the weight without without ever going hungry and basically just being sensible. And the, the book that I've written is in, written in fluent Aussie bloke. I've con- consulted professors, I've consulted dietitians, I've consulted nutritionists, not that I'm quite sure of the difference between the last two, but it's basically dressed up common sense and it's trying more to get into the headspace of blokes saying, saying, all right, if, you, if you're serious about how to do it, this is how to do it. And the guts of it, absolute guts of it is, is three basic things. One is, listen up, dickhead, stop the sugar, okay? Just, and it's not the sugar you put in your cappuccino and it's not the sugar you put on your, on your, on your wheat bix. It's the sugar that's basically in all processed food. Mm-hmm. It's to get your head around the fact that if you, if you, if you rip the top off a can, if you have to open plastic to get to it, if you have to, if it comes out of a box, if you have to turn the lid of a jar, it's processed food, and in processed food, there will be sugar because the more sugar they put into it, the more they sell. If you get your head into the fact that, two things, if it's processed, it has sugar in it. The second thing is, and this is the absolute key for me to lose the weight that I did and will keep off, is that if you stop the sugar, you stop the hunger. You're just not hungry all the time. We're not meant to have that amount of sugar. The next thing for me, I was a very big drinker, absolutely loved the past the Chardonnay, you bloody beauty, <laughs> and for me, I, you know, I was drinking way too much and I stopped the drinking and I, the, the key for me there is, the strange thing is for a man that loved drinking as much as I did, I simply don't miss it, haven't missed it a day since I stopped over two years ago and wow. I'm a better man, I'm a better man for it, I have a better marriage, I'm a better father. Everything's better. I'm far more productive at, at the work that I do, and I just feel good. And the third thing is, I guess, well, for me, is I mean, it's, it's common sense, I guess, but it is. I'm in my fifties, and when I was in my twenties, you know, I was briefly in the Wallabies. I was I played football over the world, all over the world. And then in my thirties and forties, drifted into a certain lassitude where I had a sort of a, a spinal condition, a strange spinal condition, where it was like my spine was magnetised. And any couch that was within 50 metres of me, somehow or other, the springs in the couch and my spine were somehow magnetised and it would just draw me to the couch and I'd lie on the couch and I couldn't get up, I couldn't get up. <laughs> and uh, so I got the 50 and I went, I'm getting up and I haven't stopped moving since and I feel better. So that's another part of the book. You did a program on Sunday, uh, Sweet Poison. How, how, mm-hmm. did you, how did you find out about this? Was it just common sense? It's a, I... very, it's a very good question, that one. Where did I get Sweet Poison? Somebody mentioned it to me. Now, Sweet Poison is a book by a mate of mine, David Gillespie, and he didn't start out as a mate of mine. I never met him, but I read this book on a oh, while. Well, in fact, I started reading it in Perth on my way to Africa, mm-hmm. and the, the essence of Sweet Poison is to say that, that if you look at, the most telling stuff in it is if you look at your and my great-great-grandfather would have had about two kilos of sugar a year because that's the natural human intake. You haul, you haul in the harvest, the apricots and the apples and the oranges are ready, and we have the sugar that's in the, in the rich harvested fruit. In the modern age, we're having about 50 or 60 kilos a year because the, that sort of that harvest sweetness, if you like, they whack it in everything. And, so, and what that does to use the medical, the strict medical terminology, it, I'm just trying to think of the medical term, I remember, it roots your system. Mm. It stuffs it up because you, you're, we're not meant to have that amount of sugar go through our system. And when you've got 50 or 60 kilos of sugar in your system, it means you are hungry all the time. So when you have your Tim Tams uh, at afternoon tea, it's not just the calories that you get out of that, the empty calories which give you no nutrition. It's, it's, it's that it makes you hungry at dinner time and you, you have the you know, heavy dessert, you're hungry at breakfast time. You're just hungry all the time. And so the key breakthrough for me in reading Gillespie's book, Sweet Poison, was after I stopped the sugar, I stopped being hungry all the time. Yeah, which is a great thing because then you don't go for those quick snacks, those quick impulsive meals that <laughs> always end up not being healthy. 
That's exactly right. What's sort of been the hardest thing for you to cut out? Has there been a go-to thing that you used to love all through uh, your 20s and 30s? Look, it just frankly hasn't been that hard. Somebody congratulated me on giving up the blog, said, look, I admire your willpower. And the breakthrough understanding for me is, it's like when you and I used to be smokers, that you, and so many of us used to be smokers, and you'd think for a while, look, I can just get by, you know, just a few ciggies here and there. Well, it was beyond me. I was either smoking or I wasn't smoking. And so I gave up smoking about 100 times before I finally gave it up. And now I don't need to spend any willpower at all in not smoking. I just don't want to smoke. Similarly, when I stopped putting sugar in my tea when I was 13 years old, that took willpower for three days. But then after a week, I'd lost my taste for sugar in tea and milk in tea and coffee. So you just, there's no willpower needed. And I feel the same about grog. I've lost my taste for grog. I don't want grog. And even though I could have drunk for a straighter on a bad day and kept pace with an alcoholic on a bad day, there must be a million blokes out there across our brown and pleasant land who are knocking it back like I used to knock it back, who's never given themselves a chance to stop, just stop. You don't need it. And see how you feel. I mean, for me, you may know my wife, Lisa, who co-hosts the Today Show, um, I've said this before, but I, you know that we we've been married for 25 years, just about. We're moving to our 20, we're in our 25th year now. Congratulations! And we, thank you. Well, we don't have. I've said this. We don't have a hallmark greeting card marriage, which is you know 365 days of bliss a year. We have 50 pretty. We have 50 fabulous days, 300 pretty good days that we both enjoy, and we have 15 screaming shockers. And, and, you know, which takes some recovery from. But since I stopped drinking, we have three shockers. You know, yeah. it's, it, and it's because I, without grogging my system, I don't say that the 15 shockers were all my fault. They weren't. But if I don't have grog in my system after a lunch or a dinner, I can so more easily navigate the, the shallows and shoals of difficult situations and get through and get on with our lives. Now, giving up alcohol is obviously... Is a really hard one because uh, it's integrated so much in our society. You know, we go to the pub, mm. we love to have a barbecue and have a beer. Yep. What do you do in those situations? Do you avoid those situations or you just no. have a different Well, I, I'm probably less inclined to go to the lunches and dinners than I used to be. But, you know, on Sunday, we had a mate of mine became an Australian citizen and another one announced his engagement. We had a barbecue for 30 people at our house. Everybody bought a bottle of wine and the rest of it. I sat with everybody and had a fabulous time guzzling tea like a man thing. So okay. they all know I guzzle tea. And um, I love it. I love black tea. So uh, one, my brother-in-law once said to me that when he gave up smoking, the thing that he missed most was doing something with his hand. That he used to, you know, always be opening a uh. packet and putting a figure in his mouth and lighting a match in the action and sucking on it. He enjoyed the physical activity of his hands. And for me... I understand that with drinking. And so what I do with drinking, when everybody's drinking, I have a cup of tea. And I go to a restaurant and have lunch with people and dinner with people. And I say to the waitress or the waiter, please bring me more tea than you think is good for me. <laughs> and I drink it by the gallon. Black tea. <laughs> Just love it. I mean, it does no damage to me whatsoever. Oh, well, people say you can drink too much tea and they may be right. But the answer is, if I, I used to, I used to, you know, I actually... I was with a friend from Perth the other day and she said to me that she remembered dining with me three or four years ago in Perth and she was quite shocked that, you know, I'd got through two and a half bottles. That's how heavily. I must say, that's not like me to drink that much, but I would have had <clears throat> most most lunches or dinners that I was, you know, out of the thing. I'd have probably a bottle of wine at least and on a bad day too and clearly on that day three. You know, that was a mm. hell of a lot of grog that he put in through my system. And the strange thing is emerging at the end of it not being an alcoholic, not needing it at all. So when I stop, it's just strange. It's just, I just, I just, I don't want any. I don't feel like I want any. Now it's been a journey for you. You've got three children as well, and you've often mentioned that you've become a better father because of it. How, how's the reaction mm. been from the kids and the wife? My my eldest boy gave me a great line that I used in the book, and basically it was unlikely to come from a twenty one year old, but he said that when yours, when you drink heavily on like on a Saturday night, he said. You are borrowing fun from tomorrow. And huh. it's a really interesting line. And because we all recognize the wild times on the Saturday night, waking up feeling like a dog on the Sunday morning and having a very slow Sunday because of it. Whereas now, I'm just, you know, I, I'm, I'm enjoying Saturday and Sunday. And I don't, I'm not the dickhead sitting in the corner not talking to anybody on the Saturday night. 
Um, and I would, and nor am I quite the life of the party. But if you if you think back, I look back upon there was a quote I used from I think it was an American writer, a woman who said, "When you're drinking heavily, you spend most of your time waiting." And what I recognised that immediately. If you're a heavy drinker, you sort of you're waiting for lunchtime, <laughs> and then you're waiting for dinner time, or you're waiting to go to the pub, and you're waiting to get into it. But I put it to you, and a lot of your listeners who will be heavy drinkers will recognise what I'm about to say. You get to the Sunday morning and you look back on the week just gone I put it to you it's all a bit of a blur isn't it mate mm. Where, who are you with Monday what was that about Tuesday no oh, I don't remember you know you're just knocking it back and knocking it back and I used to live like that and it was a pretty good week you know I mean I, I wouldn't I don't I don't say it's a bad week but I can say this is if you're clear in your head you're, if you if you're if you drop the weight and you're sober all the time it's a better week you're, all of your relationships are better your productivity at work is better. Your mood is better. You're not borrowing fun from tomorrow. You're having great time today and tomorrow. Yeah, it's a great great way to live. And uh, if you want to find out more information about the book, you can grab it. Of course, online, the great Aussie bloke, Slim Down. Get, it for, get, it, get it for your partner. Get and, it for your and, partner as well. Great yeah, Christmas and, stocking. And the thing is, I, the point of the exercise is, I'm not saying this as a Southern Baptist preacher, moralising, waving a finger at you. Listen, dickhead, I have spilt more wine than you've drunk, okay? So I know what I'm talking about. I'm not coming in from a moral point of view. I'm just mm. saying, we're getting older. Get onto it, mate. Get your head around this. Spirit.